Osiyam tanoya tanoan seyam in siaya seyoya qua tlaichin nomen wan hot in squalwin neta uns la tash qua shamin tanalachan osahano kamel sko omashoth greetings to all of you I will now share a welcome song from the Squamish Nation. The song belongs to the Matthias family. I have the honor to share the song with you today. OCM. Oh, oh, Hello, my name is Craig Seti. I'm the coordinator of the Indigenous Peoples Engagement and Research Council, known as IPERC, at the Kansal CKD Network. I'd like to acknowledge and give thanks to all those who were involved in the creation of the video that welcomes us and starts us on this journey of land acknowledgements and highlighting the importance and relevance of land acknowledgements. To introduce the framework of this learning series called Supporting Each Other's Journey, I'm going to share the four L's as directed by the Wabushke Bijigo Skanj Learning Pathway and also part of the training and mentorship efforts of the CanSelf CKD Network. The four L's are looking, listening, learning, and leading, and each of the following sessions will cover one of these L's. This third webinar focuses on learning learning about the impacts of colonization and its impact on Indigenous health and wellness. We have two speakers today who are going to share their experiences and their connections to community and how they relate to land acknowledgements. Our first speaker today is Leticia Pokiak, who is from Tuktoyaktuk in Inuvaluit Settlement Region. Our second speaker today is Helen Robinson Seti, who is from Dauphin River First Nation in Manitoba. I'll now pass the session over to them. Thank you. Kuinaini, thank you for the introduction, Craig. I'll be presenting on the third part of this webinar series called Learning, Enhanced Knowledge of the History of Colonization and its Impacts on Indigenous People, with a focus on my family history, the significance of the land, land stewardship, and land dispossession of Indigenous peoples of the West Coast on Vancouver Island and local main areas. My name is Benik Puck. I'm from Dukui Aptuk of the Inuvalut Settlement Region, located in the Western Arctic. My English name is Leticia Pokiak. As an Inuvialuk, I respectfully acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the unceded traditional territory of the Penlach and Comox First Nations on Vancouver Island. 
whose traditional relationship with the lands and waters continue to this day. I've been living on Comox territory off and on for 10 and a half years with many trips home during that time. 10 years is nothing compared to the thousands of years that the Pentlatch and Comox have been calling these lands and waters home. I share this photo to point out the Comox Glacier as there is local oral history that speaks to the significance of the glacier, demonstrating the relationship and connection Comox continue to have with these lands and cultural places. As a person grounded in my own culture and identity as an Inuvialuk, I acknowledge the relationship and connection to lands that Comox and Pentlash continue today. I liken a people's traditional territory to be their home in which I am a guest. I respect that these lands and waters are their property for which they have their own form of governance and values as people who continue to practice their culture and traditions on home territories, despite colonial entrenchment and encroachment. I humbly thank the stewards of this land and the natural environment that is hosting me. In my presentation today, I will demonstrate that land acknowledgement means having respect for the history and significance of the land that the original peoples have called home for thousands of years the first inhabitants who are natural stewards of the area. I will also illustrate that land is possession and privatization of traditional territories by government and industry continues today through the attempt to steamroll pipelines onto homelands and through the desecration of ancient burials, displacing original peoples on their own lands. This photo on the top left was taken in my hometown at the furthest point one can drive on the Inuvikatak Highway. It's actually called the point. The bigger photo in the slide is of my hometown Tuck. As you can see, it's surrounded by water. It's located along the Beaufort Sea in the Arctic Ocean. Tuktu Yaktuk translates to resembling a caribou, which is based on oral history. This is just one example of many significant place names and cultural landscapes. I grew up swimming in these waters, traveling seasonally out onto the land for months at a time learning of what it means to be in Inuvialuit, as well as the significance of the land, waters, and wildlife that we depend upon and are connected to. Inuvialuit health and well-being are connected to the health of the land, health of the waters, and the health of the animals, as well as maintaining a connection to the land and place names through the practice of culture and traditions. In the distance, top right of this photo, you can see one of the Pingos, as the area that I'm from is called Land of the Pingos due to the concentration of them in the area. This is a photo of Ibyuk, one of the pingos just outside of Tuk, near the Inuvikatak Highway. Pingos are significant landmarks as they were traditionally used as lookout points in search of game. They were also like a beacon when traveling out in the land or ocean, they signified that we were almost home. There are many significant landmarks, place names, and cultural landscapes that are utilized by harvesters seasonally. I took this picture during one of my visits home. My family and I had a picnic on the beach by what used to be the end of the road. You can see the faint silhouette of my kids and their cousins exploring and creating memories just as I did when I was a kid at the very same beach. This photo was taken at an ancient Inuvialuit village called Bukbuk which translates to Big River. The individual tent in the background shows where one of the crew members slept during our five week expedition. I took this photo during one of the archeological excavations that I was involved in, of which a sod house was unearthed. I share this photo to portray the extensive history of the lands and waters that Inuyal would have maintained relationship and connection to since time immemorial. The logs in the foreground are of a burial. You can see the sled runner towards the center of the photo. Our loved ones were buried with their belongings. This was how our loved ones were treated with respect, even in death. These artifacts, among many, were also unearthed, demonstrating the life that was lived 500 years before this village was no longer. Everything that the Inuvialuit needed was provided by the land. The Inuvialuit settlement region is abundant with many resources, both renewable and non-renewable. I come from Inuvialuit and Nupiak ancestors who survived and thrived off the land. These are a few of my ancestors, my maternal great-grandmother, Mamaryuk on the left, my maternal great-great-grandfather, Bukik on the right. 
and my maternal grandparents, Igalik and Angagak, are in the middle. Their English names were Lena and Bertrand Popiak. In my language, we say Nanak and Adatak for grandmother and grandfather, respectively. Their relationship with the land, waters, and its inhabitants was a lot of you know, harmony, subsisting off the land and its bounty. Together, my grandparents survived and thrived off the land. Inviolent connection and relationship to the lands and waters continue today. As an Inuvialuk who was raised traditionally, my lens and worldview stems from my Inuvialuk upbringing, supplemented by elements of a formal Western Eurocentric education. I completed the Master of Arts Anthropology program at the University of Victoria with the culmination of my thesis defense in the beginning of September, 2020. Navigating both worlds, the traditional and the modern, has been a constant in my life, considering the reach and entrenchment of colonialism, including the Arctic. This map illustrates the vast area that my grandfather Angagak traveled by dog team. He was born on March 25th, 1910, and was raised by his grandparents in the Mackenzie Delta. As a young boy, my grandfather attended the St. Peter's Residential School in Hay River, Northwest Territories up until grade three. Despite these short yet formative years of his life, he was raised traditionally. His livelihood was of the land and waters of the Western Arctic. From 1930 to 1934, he was a special constable for the RCMP who had established themselves in the region. It was in this role, he was a guide and an interpreter. He delivered mail to various posts. He traveled extensively throughout this area. During those days, people traveled by dog team. From Maklavik, he traveled to Dukkak, Kikitariuk, Tuktuyaktuk, Utkaluk, Ikariak, Kikuliurvik, Palutuk, and Pierce Point. He would then travel back to Aklavik. During the 1970s, government and industry attempted to build a gas pipeline from the tech area through the Northwest Territories to Alberta. My grandfather assisted with the regional land use and occupancy project, translating for and interviewing in Bailwood regarding their traditional subsistence areas and homelands. Eventually, he became a field worker for the Committee for Regional People's Entitlement, also known as COPE. In those days, the Inuit Tepirate Kanatomy was required by the comprehensive claims policy of the federal government to conduct land use and occupancy studies for the whole Canadian Arctic and efforts to prove title to land. Map biographies were created based on places people harvested, trapped and lived, giving harvesters voice and acknowledging their inherent rights and way of life. My grandfather Angagak recognized the significance of and was an advocate for recording Inuvialuit land use and occupancy, as he recognized the political struggle that the Inuvialuit would have to undertake to assert sovereignty and authority over Inuvialuit Inuvialuit Nunungat or Inuvialuit lands. This quote was taken from Northern Frontier, Northern Homeland, the report of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry, Volume 1, which is by Justice Thomas Berger, who was commissioned by the federal government to determine whether the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline would be feasible, not only for the sustainability of the environment, but also for the socioeconomic and cultural impacts that the people would experience. Peoples whose regions the pipeline would be intersecting. Berger meaningfully consulted with each Indigenous group and community in the Northwest Territories, whose lands the proposed pipeline corridor would intersect, thereby impacting not only their lands, but their way of life. During Berger's inquiry, my Adatak stated, quote, and Klavik, a lot of for them days, just like you white people working for wages and you have money in the bank. Well, my bank was here, all around with the fur. Whatever kind of food I wanted, if I wanted caribou, I go up in the mountains. If I wanted color fox, I went up in the mountain. In the Delta, I get mink, muskrat, but I never make a big chopper. I just get enough for my own use the coming year. Next year, the animals are going to be there anyway. That's my bank. The same way all over where I traveled. Some people said to me, why don't you put the money in the bank and save it for the future? I should have told them at that time, the North is my bank, end quote. On behalf of the Inuvialuit, COPE signed the Inuvialuit Final Agreement on June 5th, 1984, through which 
and valid land rights and sovereignty was recognized in the Canadian constitution. The federal government formally acknowledged an indigenous people's connection to and inherent rights to traditional territories. It was a long journey, 10 years of consultations, negotiations and perseverance of the coal field workers and negotiators that made the land claim a reality. As a result, Inuit have inherent rights and freedoms as stewards and caretakers of homelands and wildlife that inhabit them. Development and further encroachment onto Inuvialuit lands requires screening, review and approval by the Inuvialuit organizations before it moves forward with the federal government's consent. This map portrays not only the vastness of the area, but it also portrays the extent to which Inuvialuit traveled, occupying and using the lands and waters that sustain us. If it were not for the grassroots uprising and meaningful engagement and consultation of COPE, Inuvialuit may not have land rights, wildlife management, and funds to exercise our rights and freedoms. This is just one instance in which government and industry attempt to encroach and stake claims to territories that are not rightfully theirs to administer. Even today, government and industry are building a pipeline on the traditional territories of the Wet'suwet'en and the Unistoten in BC without the consent of their hereditary chiefs. As Indigenous people, we are continually challenged to assert our authority over our own homelands. Land dispossession and lack of acknowledgement of important heritage sites continues to this day. Just a month ago, burial sites on the Wasanich and Lekwungen territory on South Vancouver Island are being desecrated in the name of development. This is not an isolated incident as it has happened on the Tla'amin Nation's territory across Vancouver Island as well shortly thereafter. Tla'amin Nation is basically across from Comox on the mainland. These are just a couple examples in which Indigenous human remains have been unsuspectingly dug up. Yet these sacred sites are not treated with the respect that one would expect at a to express at a burial site or graveyard, which is with dignity and respect that sacred burial sites are to be shown. They demonstrate and embody how government and industry treat indigenous peoples. With no regard for indigenous peoples, their sacred places and ancestors that inhabit them. It is past the time that we all acknowledge whose lands we live on and acknowledge that their relationship and connection to homelands are a part of who they are as stewards and caretakers of lands that we as guests may take for granted. Health of the land and waters are important for the maintenance of human health in relation to that land. The very health of the land and waters that Indigenous people are concerned for and try to protect for generations to come. What I've shared with you is the encroachment and entrenchment of colonial ways that impact Indigenous lands and sovereignty. Indigenous sovereignty over traditional territories that are sought after for the value and resources they hold is theirs and theirs alone. For these territories cannot, nor will they ever be more important to any other group that more than they do to the Indigenous group to which they belong. So the aim of my presentation was to demonstrate that land acknowledgement means having respect for the history and significance of the land that the original peoples have called home for thousands of years original peoples who were the first stewards of the area. I've also demonstrated that land dispossession and privatization of traditional territories by government and industry continues today through the attempt to steamroll pipelines onto traditional territories and through the desecration of ancient burials, displacing original peoples on their own homelands. So I pose a few questions to you, the audience who I hope has come to understand the importance of lands and waters that indigenous peoples call home. What do the lands and waters mean to you? Do you know whose traditional territory you reside on? How can you move forward in a good way with good intentions, acknowledging the dark colonial history of Canada who continues to marginalize indigenous peoples? Queen Aini, thank you for taking the time to watch and listen to my presentation. Um, our next speaker is uh, Helen Robinson Seti, and so I'll pass it over to you to uh, share your presentation. Rich. Tansi Anin Buju. My name is Helen Robinson Seti, and thank you, Craig, for that introduction. I also want to acknowledge the song that was uh, rendered by um, by Elder Latash Nahani. I want to. Um, 
let you know where I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is the center of Canada. It's also situated on the Treaty 1 territory, homeland of the Métis Nation, and also the ancestral land of the Anishinaabe, which is my nation, which is also the Ojibwe Soto people, the Inunu, the Dakota, and in the northern part of our province here in Manitoba, the Dene and the Inuit. Next slide, please. I am honored to share my understanding of land acknowledgement through the teaching of the circle of life. The circle of life perspective is about sharing stories of why we honor treaties and the land acknowledgement. And part of this is leading by example. You'll see here that the circle has four directions. And we really believe that teaching in a holistic way of understanding and living a good life. As I move through my presentation, I will start in the east direction, which is the physical realm. I will share my story of how the physical teachings of the land acknowledgement have affected my life. Then I will move to the south direction and share an emotional understanding in the west, spiritual understanding, and in the north, a mental understanding that ends with the voices of the youth. Next slide, please. So here, the treaty, uh, treaty and land acknowledgement, we start in the east direction, which is the physical. This photo here is a picture of my home, Dauphin River. Both my parents were raised here in this community. Because my parents follow the natural ways of law, hunting, trapping, fishing, harvesting plants and berries, my, grand, my great grandparents remained in this community. So three generations of my, of my family have lived in Dauphin River. This is also the homeland of the Anishinaabe and the Soto people. There are only a few people still living in Dauphin River from my parents' generation. They were fluent in the Soto language, also known as Ojibwe or Anishinaabe Mwin. This is the language that was given to us by the creator as a gift. In this land uh, where my parents are from, there's also, we, we also acknowledge the water and people live, uh, it's the people of the land where the river flows into the lake. And since this time, I just learned uh, just the other day that my home community um, they, through the, the, the Soto uh, dialect, they have a, it's a TH dialect. So actually they, they switch, they, they have a different way of spelling the name there. So, but today for the purpose of this presentation, I'm, I'm going to continue just to use the spelling that's here in this presentation. There, um, so that's the traditional name of our territory, of our, our, our community. And most of our communities in Manitoba do have uh, the traditional names. And usually that, that name is the description of a land of the land uh, where it's situated. So for my home community, it's where the river like drains or flows uh, into uh, the lake, into a larger body of water. So this is how sacred the land is to my people. Our communities are named to describe where it is located and how beautiful the land is. Treaty 2 territory. This is the traditional territory that my home community was signatory to this treaty also in 1871, which is the first treaty signed um, in Canada, which is Treaty 1 territory was also signed in 1871. So my parents, they grew up on this river and ever since we were young children, we were taught to respect and honor water. Next slide, please. I just wanted to honor uh, through this slide, this is a flag of my home community. And um, I wanted to, I wanted to um, show the slide to um, honor the residents, my, my family members who passed away from COVID-19 
uh, this past year and uh, at the tail end of last year. So I, I wanted to dedicate this, this presentation to them. Next slide, please. When we talk about treaty and land acknowledgement in the South direction here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the emotional connection to treaty and land acknowledgement. So this first picture here shows uh, my home, Winnipeg, where I currently live on Treaty 1 territory. It's the homeland of the Métis Nation. It's the ancestral land of the Anishinaabe, the Inuit, the Dakota. And in the Northern part, we never want to forget our Dene and any and our Inuit. This picture really shows the beauty of the Red River, which flows through the city of Winnipeg. As a child, we lived a five minute walk um, from this river. When my parents moved uh, to Winnipeg in 1958 from Dauphin River, my mother was lonely for the river because the river was right there in front of them where they lived. And so she would take us kids for a walk and we would sit and watch the river flow from, from the banks. And so as an adult now, and when I was asked to, to do this presentation, I remembered that emotional connection to the land that my mother had. And I, and I thought how lonely she must have been having to leave her community and, and, and move to this new part of the province. And uh, I thank my mother for that, for that memory and for um, taking us and teaching me how to uh, respect the water. The second picture here is also, um, and this is where my mother used to bring us when we were children. Uh, this, uh, this view here, this is called the Alexander Dock. And um, this picture is a sad, it's, it's sad in one way. And uh, the people in this, in this photograph here are um, attending a vigil and it's a, and a ceremony for a young girl, the late Tina Fontaine whose body was found in this river. Her body was found wrapped in a blanket and plastic, or as many people say, even a garbage bag. And her body was found on August the 17th of 2014 and she was missing, she was a, she was a child in care. And so her death, her death uh, caused and prompted a national inquiry and that inquiry also produced a report about missing young girls and ones who are in the child welfare system. And you can find out more information about, um, about this. There's lots of articles and the report is also available online. But the purpose for me sharing this story is the injustices towards indigenous people. And through acknowledging the land and the water, you also acknowledge the harms and these harms to Indigenous people, in this case here to this young, this young beautiful spirit who went uh, way too soon. And so we see here people celebrating this beautiful life, even though it was a sad one. And um, so I wanted to share that story, um, not to make people sad or upset, but the importance of, of acknowledging, um, you know, the water and the harms that are done to our people. Next slide, please. This uh, slide talks about the spiritual aspect of treaty and land acknowledgement. And this picture here is of my son, uh, my grandson, um, Ogima Benes. And um, it was taken last uh, August of uh, 2020. And we were harvesting sage, um, carrying, uh, you can see me carrying a bundle there and you can also see it in the photograph there, that lightish green um, plant medicine that's, that's growing. And uh, so we went and harvest the sage at one of our, our Sundance sites and it's, it grows in abundance there. So when we talk about treaty and land acknowledgement from a spiritual perspective, we talk about it that this land is our home as indigenous people, we have nowhere else to go. This is, this is where we live. This is where we, we die. We don't go, we don't have anywhere else to go. This is, this is our, our traditional 
and ancestral territories. And so we're also taught on this land to be caretakers of the land. And because of us being caretakers of the land, we also have a spiritual connection to this land. And so in this picture here, you'll see, you'll, you'll see me, um, I'm, I'm there <clears throat> wearing my skirt and, and there's a lot of teachings about the skirt, but in this picture, I'm wearing a skirt because when I wear that skirt, it announces to, to Nimama Aki, Mother Earth, my earth, the earth, my mother, that I'm here. So it announces that. And so <clears throat> the land is our mother. And we're also taught that our mother also has those lifeblood flowing through. And so water is also life. And for us, we have a, um, a relationship with all of creation. And, and so that's that spiritual part. Um, when we talk about when we talk about land acknowledgement, and when people do land acknowledgement, what you're doing is you're showing respect to the land by acknowledging who we are, where we come from, and our purpose in life. Next slide, please. This uh, particular direction here, it's, it's what we call the mental, um, mental or intellectual component. But I, this um, young, young man, <laughs> His name is David Robertson. He's an author. He's an Inanu Cree from, uh, whose family is originally from the Norway House Cree Nation in Northern Manitoba. And he's also an author of numerous novels and, and graphic novels and children's books. And um, I was scrolling through Facebook one evening here on March the 8th, and I saw this um, post by him and uh, I was really moved by it, and I and I asked him if I if I asked him if I could use this for a presentation that I was actually preparing for on land acknowledgement, <clears throat> and he said absolutely. So, so anyway, this is what his this is a direct quote from him. He says, "I was floored when the kids at Lillianburg Elementary School read this land acknowledgement before my event with them, and of course the event was a virtual event. They wrote it all themselves." and did it directly from the heart. This is how you do a meaningful land acknowledgement. If you're a teacher, have your kids work on something like this. It means a lot, end of quote, David Robertson. Next slide, please. So this is what the children wrote. So I'm going to read it to you. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation and as treaty people, we would like to acknowledge and recognize that our meeting today takes place on the traditional lands of the Treaty 3 Anishinaabe people. We also recognize that the students and families we learn and work at our school and also extend to the lands beyond Treaty 3 into Treaty 5 and the Treaty 9 territories. And so we honor those lands and relationships with the Anishinaabe peoples as well. As it states in the Barren Grounds, and the Barren Grounds is actually one of the books that David Robertson wrote, quote, the land provides everything that anybody would need. If you take only what you need, the land will renew itself so that it can provide more. Medicines, water, plants, and meat. In exchange, because we don't really have anything the land wants, we honor it for what it gives us, end quote. As students representing classes across our board, we are grateful to the land for the many resources. <clears throat> we are grateful for the outdoor learning environment many of our school grounds provide. We are grateful for the trees and the rocks that we can build the forts with. We are grateful for the hills that we can slide down in the winter. <clears throat> Sorry. We are grateful for the fields we have to play soccer, baseball, and tag on. We understand that this land gives us all, and it is our responsibility to take care of this land. Please take a moment now to acknowledge what this land gives to you and how you honor it. Thank you. So isn't that a beautiful land acknowledgement by students? And um, so, you know, a lot of times students teach us many things. I, I recently worked with a group of students and I was so impressed 
you know, that before their presentation, they also wrote their own personal land acknowledgement. You know, so here, if children and young people can do it, you know, we as adults working in our various groups and organizations, you know, collectively, we can also draft our own treaty and land acknowledgements. And for those people that are in treaty territories, not everybody's in treaty territory. A lot of people still leave, live in unceded territories. Next slide, please. So this last slide here, I'm talking about uh, still in the North direction. And I just wanna talk just briefly about um, honoring the next seven generations. Because one of the teachings that was given to me was that my elders tell me that whenever I'm making important decisions to think about the next seven generations, our young people are taking responsibility for protecting the land and you can do your part by now acknowledging our ancestors and those yet unborn. So I'm going to show you a short video clip, which is uh, my son, Kevin Satie, when he was the president of the University of Winnipeg Students Association, um, which, which this video was recorded in 2017. He's no longer the president there, but um, as uh, his presidency was, was a one year term. So I'm going to have them play that video, that short video now. Kansini Buju, Ogi Ma Megisi, Indigenous Kaios Ma Kondudem. My English name is Kevin Sati, and I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I don't have the connection to the land that I would like to have, um, but there are a lot of people that do have that connection to the land and to the animals and to the water. And I think it's important that, you know, everybody listens to them, you know, to listen to the trappers, to the hunters, to the people that are living on the land, because they're the ones that are seeing the changes. And uh, they see the changes in the animal and all the cycles. And, you know, we know that the animals are going to suffer. And if the animals suffer and the land suffers, we're going to suffer. I think what it comes down to is like, what a lot, even what we learned from Standing Rock, you know, is that water is life. And we can't survive if we don't have clean drinking water. And we can't survive if, you know, we have our temperatures that are going up. And, you know, we're having droughts in the prairies. You know, where are we going to get our food from? And, uh, you know, those are the big things that people need to be thinking about. Um, and with the pipelines being built, um, it just goes to show that the process of colonization has never stopped. And, you know, will most likely not stop under a Canadian government under the Canadian state and uh, it'll be very it's going to be very difficult to to make those changes um, and to stop you know those pipelines but um, if we look at Standing Rock if we look at Oka if we look at um, what's going what's brewing right now on the west coast with Kinder Morgan you know I think that's what it's going to come down to So um, here are some of the references that I used um, in this video. I want to say miigwech uh, for listening, and I encourage you to draft your own land acknowledgement to show respect and honoring the First Nations, um, the First Peoples of this land. And if your organization al already has a treaty uh, or land acknowledgement, you know, use it. You know, use it when you can. You know, to honor um, our loved ones. Um, who have gone on, those that are here and those that are yet to be unborn. And for this, I say miigwech to all of you. I give thanks to the speakers on our session today. Miigwech, thank you for sharing your time, your energy and your knowledge with us. For me, these learning experiences help me to remember the nuanced journeys that we take when we're learning about land acknowledgements. Also to remember the First Nations Métis and Inuit communities whose traditional, ancestral, unceded or treaty territories that we're living and maintaining our relationships on are linked to our health and our wellness. We look forward to sharing more of the learning series with you. Please join our next session, Webinar 4, Leading, where I will summarize some key points from the previous three webinars and I'll also share about land acknowledgements as a first step in building better cultural humility and cultural competency. We'll see you again.